Hi folks, this is Jason. Hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. Uh, we're doing a Google Hangout for an hour on the life and thought of Rudolf Bultmann, part one, and hopefully we'll be able to do part two tomorrow night. Um, and what I hope to do is to explore uh, the liberal uh, theologian, uh, Rudolf Bultmann. Uh, he's a very important theologian, and um, it's good to know the history of theology. Uh, as you all know, I'm an evangelical preacher, and I believe the Bible is the word of God. I do not agree with uh, Bultmann's theology in any way, so I don't want you to get the wrong impression that this is all about endorsing Bultmann. I certainly do not endorse Rudolf Bultmann's theology. But as uh, someone who has a theological education, and who reads widely in theology. I like to read about other theologians and I like to think about what they've said. And I think it's also good for uh, Christians to know what other people are thinking or what other people have thought in the past. And so that's really the whole point of this is, is really it's an educational uh, piece to educate people as to uh, the history of Christianity and various theologians. So again, I must re reiterate that because we are doing the life and thought of Rudolf Bultmann, I am not endorsing his theology. If you want to know my theology, go and listen to the preacher Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, or go to the Brief Fellowship and listen to the lectures of Francis Schaeffer, and put Lloyd Jones and Francis Schaeffer together, and that's where I stand theologically speaking. Uh, so that's where I am. So without further ado, we're going to just pray and then share a scripture, and then we shall get on. <coughs> Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for your love. And we thank you for your grace, and we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. And Father, we pray as we look at uh, Rudolf Bultmann today, I just pray as we think about his life, I pray as we reflect upon it, that we can learn some lessons for today uh, in our own ministries, in our own walk with you. Uh, we ask this, Lord, in your name and for your glory. Amen. <clears throat> so the scripture reading um, is... Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, it says, I give you command to the presence of God in Christ Jesus, the one who will judge the living and the dead, and by his coming and his kingdom preach the good news. Be ready at all times and tell people what they need to do. Tell them when they are wrong. Encourage them with great patience and careful teaching, because the time will come when people will not listen to the true teaching but we'll find many more teachers who please them by saying things they want to hear. So that, that's just a scripture to encourage us to make sure that we're biblical pastors, biblical preachers, biblical theologians, and biblical Christians. Rudolf Bultmann was certainly not biblical in the sense that he believed the full inspiration of the Bible and what Orthodox Christianity teaches. And the church, above all else, needs shepherds who will shepherd the sheep. Faithful theologians, faithful shepherds. And for all the conversation that we're going to talk about Boltman today, he was not a faithful shepherd of the word of God. And no matter how big a reputation you have as a theologian, your primary job is not to be an intellectual, it's not to be an intellectual superstar in the academic world, in theology. Your job as a theologian is to shepherd the sheep. Your job as a theologian is to feed the church the word of God and you have to be faithful to, to that task. So without further ado we're now going to talk about Rudolf Bultmann which will be more of an academic theological uh, discussion. Um, the source for this <coughs> for this uh, reflection today is from uh, David Ferguson's Rudolf Bultmann um, series Continuum London New York 
1992. So that's where the source of this um, discussion uh, is coming from. I, I've read half of the book and uh, I have interacted with some of Bultmann's writing. Uh, on page one, it says that Rudolf Bultmann was born on the 30th of July, 1884. Um, Bultmann was educated uh, under liberal theologians. Um, His academic career developed uh, where he taught a junior lecturer in Marburg in 1912 to 1916, was associate professor at Belus in 1916 to 1920, professor in Gießen in 1920 1921, returned to Marburg in 1920, 1921. But, um, the most important thing I think is to remember that Boltman's theology, uh, this is what the writer uh, Ferguson notes here that on page two, that his theology was done in the context of Europe and in uh, military conflict. We had the First World War uh, and then we had the Second World War and so Boltman's theology and theological reflection is coming within that context. In his later life Right about 1951, he goes to the United States and delivers the Schaffer Lectures at Yale Divinity School in 1955. He came to Britain where he gave the Guildford Lectures at Edinburgh University. And Boltman died on the 30th of July, 1976. <coughs> there is an article um, published uh, on Boltman's life um, just trying to get the reference. The various Yeah, um Sorry, the, the reference here, which I'm about to read a quote from, from Boltman, is, Is faith still possible? Memories of Rudolf Boltman and reflections on the philosophical aspects of his work, Harvard Theological Review, uh, 75, 1982, page 2 and 3. So this is a quote, not sorry, not by Boltman, but by Hans Jones, one of Boltman's students. Boltman was the only one of my academic teachers to whom I paid a farewell visit before my emigration. It was in the summer of 1933. Here in Marburg we sat around the dinner table with his lovely, so richly emotional wife with the three school do schoolgirl daughters and I related what I had just read in the newspaper but he not, but he not yet, namely, that the German Association of the Blind had expelled its Jewish members. My horror carried me into eloquence. In the face of eternal night, so I exclaimed, the most unifying tie there can be among suffering men, this betrayal of the solidarity of common fate. And I stopped, for my eyes fell on Boltman, and I saw that a deathly pallor had spread over his face, and in his eyes was such agony that the words died in my mouth. In that moment I knew that in matters of elementary humanity one could simply rely on Boltman, that words, explanations, arguments, most of all rhetoric were out of place here, that no insanity of the time could dim the steadiness of his inner light. He himself had not said a word, ever since this episode has belonged to the image of the inly moved but outwardly so unemotional man. So, politically, in the time of um, the Nazis, um, Boltman spoke out against it, which I'm going to mention later. Whether you agree with Boltman or not, and I don't agree with his theology, um, you have to give him the fact that he was a very sincere man. 
politically speaking, where he did stand up against Hitler, which did cause a breach between him and his friend Martin Heidegger. Martin Heidegger was, um, as you probably know, a philosopher, a uh, well-known um, philosopher even today is widely read, but uh, Heidegger was influenced by Nazism at the time, the more the, the kind of uh, the more of the political uh, socialist kind of I think Nazism. Uh, he was influenced by that, and but that caused a breach between him and Rudolf Bultmann. Um, now, now we get to the, my favourite part, and so we can I can talk ad lib now. Uh, so we we stuck closely to. The first chapter of um, David Ferguson's book. Uh, now I could speak more loosely. Um, in the second chapter, uh, he talks about the legacy of liberalism, and he talks about the Enlightenment's critique of religion. He talks about the Bible, and he so he, he notes that. Well, first of all, it's important to note that Bultmann was a child of liberal theology, that he, he grew out of liberal theology, that he kept on the liberal theological tradition. This is a key with Bultmann. If you don't understand this, then you don't understand Bultmann, that he was an inheritor of liberal theology. And so you have to understand the psychology of liberal theology, how it came to be. So... The first thing is is about the Bible. The Bible came under massive attack during the Enlightenment with the scientific revolution. Um, you had Newton and the new sciences developing and it seemed that the Bible was just out of focus. There was also questions about authorship, biblical criticism. Um, there were questions about who wrote Moses, the book of uh, the book of the Pentateuch, was it Moses? So you had this scientific revolution and you had this biblical criticism rising and this was a devastating attack on the Bible during the Enlightenment. There was also the devastating attack by David Hume. David Hume was saying that miracles can't happen because miracles don't happen. Natural laws mm -hmm. take place but they, there is no evidence for um, mm -hmm. miracles taking place. And so Boltman inherited this this enlightenment perspective which came also from you you had the dismantling of philosophical proofs by God by Immanuel Kant and so these three great facts in the enlightenment the new sciences the biblical criticism were well, four facts the the biblical criticism the new sciences and the powerful philosophical argument by David Hume and the powerful philosophical argument by Immanuel Kant led to the creation of liberal theology. If you don't understand that, you don't understand liberal theology, that those are the areas that, that created liberal theology. They were the kind of health, breath, the air that liberal theology breathed they were the heirs of the Enlightenment, the new knowledge. And just incidentally, um, I want to go back and just critique the Enlightenment just for a second. Critique the 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 um, the Enlightenment position before we move on to the development of liberal theology. So what we're doing now is we're looking at the intellectual heritage of Rudolf Bultmann. The writings that he wrote, the thinking that he did, comes from the intellectual roots of liberalism. But liberalism was, an, was a child of the Enlightenment. So I just want to unpack, just for a minute, the problems with the Enlightenment perspective that we have now. So, first of all, biblical criticism. In the Enlightenment, because of Valhausen, uh, Moses, uh, the Pentateuch, came under critical attack. And it has held sway, Valhausen hypothesis has held sway 
for a few hundred years. It's been a powerful critique against the Pentateuch. But it's interesting to know <clears throat> how fashions change. That the Valhausen hypothesis today is basically and has been in a crisis. The scientific attack upon the Bible, well, I think that actually today I think we can I, I think we can say that science shows the Bible to be correct. It was only a few years ago the scientists said that matter was eternal. Now they say matter had a beginning, the Big Bang. That's one area where science for a long time said that matter was eternal, the Bible is wrong, but had to change the perspective, said no, there was a Big Bang. <clears throat> and I could go on with other areas where science actually confirms the Bible, not deconfirms the Bible. David Hume's argument against miracles uh, can easily be debunked on two perspectives. The first perspective is the historical perspective. To use a scientific argument to say that miracles can't happen because in history, uh, in, in, in our experience, we don't see miracles happen, that nature works according to um, its structures and those structures don't allow for the supernatural, etc. That kind of argument can be debunked on two grounds. Number one, historical grounds. At the end of the day, if someone claims a miracle has taken place in history, then you cannot prejudge that miracle claim. You have to examine the miracle claim to see whether it comes under the scrutiny and passes the test. It's interesting to note that skeptics generally don't have any test to test whether a miracle has taken place in history. Now, David Hume actually did come up with five criteria to examine miracles. And when he used those five criteria on miracles, i.e. the miracles that took place in France in the 1600s, he said that they fitted his criteria and that according to his criteria they were miracles. But then again he said, even though they fit my criteria, I still can't accept miracles because miracles just don't happen. So basically, Hume's argument can be debunked based on the fact that you have to have a criteria to look at them in history. And if you have that criteria, they might actually prove miracles take place. He proved it to David Hume, but he still pushed the evidence away. Secondly, the scientific argument doesn't hold water. Because at the quantum level in science, in the physical realm, we found that we don't really fun, uh, fully understand what's going on at the quantum level. So it could possibly be that an event takes place in history that we did not understand because we don't understand the quantum level. So in other words, science works on probability. And there's always a possibility that your understanding of a particular piece of knowledge in the physical realm will be overturned. So in other words, you always have to be open. You cannot be exclude the possibility of a miracle. Because you cannot say for sure what goes on at the quantum level. So you always have to be open. So on the science, on the biblical criticism, on David Hume's argument, uh, the Enlightenment is in trouble today. And then finally, the philosophical argument by Immanuel Kant. Apparently, he debunked the philosophical arguments for the existence of God, but yet, it's interesting to note, there has been a revival in the philosophy of religion the last 20 years. Powerful, analytic philosophers who were Christians have begun to write massive critiques of secularism, and there are now departments within universities that are actually studying these thick philosophers, such as Alvin Plantinga. So the philosophical arguments have not gone away. They've actually come back, but in different forms and in a robust manner than ever before. And the philosophical defense of Christianity 
is stronger now than it ever was. So that's just a little thought on the actual enlightenment. But let's get into more detail about how uh, liberal theology developed. First of all, you had Frederick Schleimacher, 1768 to 1834. He was the doyon of the development of uh, liberal theology. And basically, what um, Schleimacher said is religion is not based in the intellect. Uh, Christianity is not based on an argument. It is based upon a feeling, a feeling of consciousness, that within Christ is the full consciousness of the God consciousness. And the church is the consciousness of the God consciousness that we find in Christ. And it's this consciousness uh, theology, uh, this reflection of this consciousness within community, that was the foundation and the development of liberal theology. Then you had Ebrek Rachel in 1822 to 89, and he wanted to locate the Christian faith best rooted in history. So he looked at the kingdom of God and tried to analyze what the kingdom of God was. We read, um, let's just see if I can find it. Uh, in the Christian Doctrine of Justification and Reconciliation, Edinburgh 1900, page 387. This is Richard. He says, Thus what in the his his historically complete figure of Christ we recognize to be the real worth of his existence gained for ourselves through the uniqueness of the phenomenon and its normative bearing upon our religious ethical destiny the worth of an abiding rule since we at the same time discover that only through the impulse and direction we see from him is it possible for us to enter into his relation to God and to the world. So what Rachel wanted to do is get to the historical core of Christ and then from there deduce some practical lessons in, in living the Christian life. Um, basically it was a socialist agenda that he used to apply to Christianity and the hermeneutic of Christian text. So when he talks about the kingdom of God, it's really just another word for socialist ideas, really. Uh, but yeah. Ritchell was a very important plank in the development of liberal theology. His school was a powerful school in the 19th century when many people yeah. followed his ideas. He was what is called, in quotes, a post-Kantian. In other words, he was influenced by Kantian philosophy. Then the development of liberal theology can be found in Wilhelm Hermann, 1846 to 1922. He writes, knowledge of God is not generally valid or probable knowledge, but is the defense so this expression of individual experience. So in other words, again, it's not about intellectual faith, but it's about experience. This whole liberal agenda, uh, liberal theology that developed with um, Yeah, sorry about that. Um, the development of liberal theology was undercut by the history of religious school, uh, especially by Ernest Trollich, 1865-1923. Basically, they were saying that you've got to get back to the first century, and also they were saying what's so special about any particular historical time frame, because all time frames are connected to each other. And that basically challenged the presupposition of liberal theology which said that even though they don't have an intellectual argument for Christ they had a, an experience or a feeling or a social connection with Christ uh, the Christ of faith it presumed that Christ was unique amongst 
any other historical figure. But the history of uh, the history, the historical school, were basically saying, "Well, what is what is the difference? Why is one particular history more important than another?" It, it can't be because all historical situations flow through other historical situations or events. All other events, historical events, flow by other historical events. So Ernest Trollich, 1865-1923, was important in the development of this. And we read, this entanglement of Christianity in the wider context, this is the historical school's philosophy, and this is what undercut liberal theology. <clears throat> Excuse me. This entanglement of Christianity in the wider context, this is this is Trollich. This entanglement of Christianity in the wider context of the history of religion, with all its analogies and real connections, and in the currents of ordinary practical and intellectual life, place it completely in the stream of the historical process. The question then arises how far its religious ideas and power is in any respect ultimate, perfect and absolute. The concepts of revelation and redemption asserted by the older liberalism and by Schleiermacher, though in the form of absolute religion, breaking through rather than as a miracle opposed to all the rest of history, are thus threatened by being drawn into the fluctuations of revelation in ordinary spiritual life. It becomes a question how far Christianity has such a definite religious phenomenon which complete everything. It therefore becomes a question too how far it is to, to, to be seen as revelation and redemption in the absolute sense. End of quote. So I'm just going to backtrack now, um, and I just want to unpack about liberalism. Um, some some key things about liberalism that I think need to be worked over. Again, I must stress this is important. We've looked at the development of liberal theology. Now, again, it's important to note that Bultmann was an, an heir of this liberal tradition of theology, and he was to take this liberal theology on and move it on into the 20th century. But what I want to do is just, each time we go through these various movements, I just want to reflect upon their implications, and I want to deconstruct them. So I want to deconstruct the liberal theology that was in Schleiermacher, Ritchell, and Herman, and to point out to you uh, the problems of this liberal theology. First of all, liberal theology was non-propositional. It didn't believe in propositional revelation. It didn't believe that there was eternal propositional truth given in the Bible. Um, so what tended to happen is the primacy of the intellect and the importance of objective truth was pushed aside and basically um, there was a giving up of the idea of the classic understanding of Christian truth and more of a softening and becoming a subjective so for example Schleiermacher was saying that the ground of Christianity is feeling and he tried to give the feeling of, of consciousness some kind of objectivity by talking about community and that in the community there is objectivity there if we study it there we can find the consciousness but ultimately it's on the the individual's faith is rested on feeling but that is subjective and I think Christianity talks about be transformed by the renewing of your mind it talks about Jesus dying and rising again in the gospel and that this is the truth. So Christianity is not just about feeling, it's about the truth of the gospel. So that was a dangerous teaching by Schleiermacher. And then when you look at Rachel, basically, his if you look at his, his massive book uh, on justification, it's an absolute massive book. I've looked at some of what he said. But you'll find uh, in the book that he has a polemic, and the polemic goes something like this, that the church is not being faithful to the Bible, we're going to be faithful to the Bible and go back to what the, the Bible actually teaches and what it actually teaches. It doesn't teach 
justification by faith in the personal sense it actually is a more communal community aspect of of justification so the problem there is salvation is moved from personal salvation to community salvation um, so basically what we're getting really is not biblical exegesis is basically bringing in socialism and using that as a hermeneutic and then saying that you're being biblical but putting biblical language to socialist ideas and that's all as liberalism was liberalism was just a socialist agenda to show practical care to people which is, is good but it was not Christianity in the sense of coming from Christian theology it was coming from political reflection using political ideas but transmuting those political ideas into theological words and then saying that is biblical now on the historical the, the uh, historical school by Ernest Trollich I agree that they, the church needed to go back to the first century I agree with this position that the historical school stated but the reason why it the, this school is significant and why it undermined liberalism is liberalism again had the presupposition that Jesus was special but the historical school was basically saying that all historical events flow into each other so why is there a special event they're all connected there is no isolated special event and so that was a, a major challenge to liberalism the other thing that challenged liberalism is first world war because that made people realize that this liberal theology that said everything's going to be peaceful and we're all going to love each other just wasn't in reality going to happen because they had the first world war from the liberalism later into the developed a quest for the historical Jesus which I'm going to talk to you now and this is important in understanding where Bultmann lay in all this in 1928 1729 81 Gotthold Lessing a German wrote about the ugly ditch in history and basically what he said is we can't get how can we get to the historical past we only know it by probability we can't get to the historical court of Jesus it was a major major essay in in Germany at the time and has continued to have a relevance today so we could never fully get to the core of Jesus historically that's what Rudolf uh, sorry that's what Lessing was saying and that was a major plank in the development of not only liberal theology but in the historical Jesus studies you had um, people like David Frederick Strauss the life of Jesus 1835 that were extreme rationalists that discounted miracles uh, you had uh, Ernest Renan his life of Jesus 1863 who said Jesus was a romantic poet then you had the development of FC Barr and the Tübingen school and you had excuse me you had uh, landmark writers such as Reed and Wise and then you had the development of eschatology that is to say that there was a looking at Jesus from end time teaching of what Jesus taught so we read these words it's imperative to perceive Bultmann as a thinker in this historical tradition as we have seen he trained as a New Testament scholar rather than a systematic theologian 
So basically, it's imperative to see all that I've just talked about, that Boltman came through the Enlightenment, came through the liberal theology. Uh, we read, liberal theology owed its distinctive character chiefly to the primacy of historical interest. In that field, it made its greatest contribution. We who have come from a background of liberal theology could never have become theologians, nor remain such as we not encountered in the liberal theology, the earnest search for radical truth. Here we felt was the atmosphere of truth in which alone we could breathe. That was Bultman. Now, so liberal theology went through a crisis. It went through a crisis because the First World War shattered some of its basic ideas. And new theological thinking about eschatology undermined the liberal agenda and liberal theological reflection. But then you had a new movement which Bultmann became part of, which was the dialectical school of theology. You had um, Karl Barth in 1868 to 1968 and, and uh, Frederick Gorkerton in 1887-1867. And Bultmann was part of this movement. And basically this movement was basically saying that God acts in history that we can't fully know God. Uh, Bart wrote a, a commentary in 1922 on Romans which fleshed out some of this idea. But basically it was kind of taking existential philosophy and it's basically saying that we can know God in the moment. We can know God in the action. but only as the God or holy other. You do not know God in propositions. You do not know God in historical truth, but only in the act. And so Boltman became part of this Bartian uh, Brunner kind of neo-orthodoxy or dialectical theology. I want to just give a little critique of dialectical theology. First of all, the problem with dialectical theology or neo-orthodoxy is number one, these theologians were not um, inerrantists, they didn't believe in the full inspiration of the Bible, Karl Barth didn't believe in the full inspiration of the Bible, Boltman didn't believe in the full inspiration of the Bible. The implication of that is, basically, if you're building a theology and it's not fully based on the Bible, then it becomes your own theology. And so in the end, Karl Barth builds a theology based on his own ideas. It seems as if he's being biblical, but he's not. There's a, there's a hermeneutic of control from his inherent rationalism, which is a kind of existential kind of philosophy that's being brought to bear on his interpretation of the Bible. The New Testament of Theology, uh, page 39, we read, The gospel is not a religious message to inform mankind of the divinity or to tell them how they may become divine. The gospel proclaims a God utterly distinct from men. Salvation comes to them from him because they are, as men, incapable of knowing him and because they have no right to claim anything from him. The Epistle to Romans, 1933, page 28, sorry. Now, that's uh, Karl Barth. Uh, 
I'll just read that again. The gospel is not a religious, religious message to inform mankind of the divinity or to tell them how they may become divine. The gospel proclaims a God utterly distinct from men. Salvation comes to them from him because they are, as men, incapable of knowing him because they have no right to claim anything for from him. Just a few things here, and I want to say this about liberalism as, as well as neo-orthodoxy or dialectical theology. And um, Boltman took the dialectical theology. He took liberalism, he took dialectical theology, he put them together, and he came up with his own theolo theology, his, his existential kind of theology. Yeah. So we've critiqued liberalism, but I want to critique neo-orthodoxy. And not only are these neo-orthodox theologians that they weren't inerrantists, but they will use Christian language, religious language, and they basically right. don't mean the same things as that you and I use them. When they talk about God, they're not talking about the God of history, the God who, of the Bible. The God they are talking about is a God you cannot know. It's a God you cannot really know. That's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is a God of truth that you can know this God. You can't know God fully, but you can know this God in truth. And there's the big difference. So all this language seems to be Christian, but it's actually devoid of Christian theology. It's actually devoid of what actually the Bible's teaching. And yet you wouldn't miss it unless you were trained in theology. Uh, the, the other thing about these uh, neo-orthodox theologians, um, if you look at Bultmann's Dogmatics, it's a three-volume work, um, you know, he's only a man. Um, his Dogmatics is very poor in dealing with opposing views of theology. If you look at Karl Barth's work um, and his dogmatics, you find uh, that he speaks in fourth tongue. He, he, he talks double Dutch. You uh, often say one thing and then deny it in the next chapter. So you'll talk about the elect, that there is the elect of God. But then he'll say everybody's elect. So there's a contradiction there. Either there is the elect or there isn't the elect. But he'll talk about the elect of God. And then he'll say everybody's going to be elected. In other words, there's no difference between the church and the world. So you've got to be careful with these neo-orthodox theologians. And be aware that theologians today, they can use Christian language, seem nearly orthodox, but actually be a million miles away from what Christianity actually is. And that's what you get with the neo-orthodox. So we've looked at the Enlightenment, we've looked at liberal theo theological development, we've looked at the historical, we, we've looked at the history of religion school in Trollage, We've looked at the historical Jesus studies, and we've looked at dialect, dialectical theology. And all these influences went into Rudolf Bultmann. Rudolf Bultmann would have eat, breed this intellectual atmosphere as he goes on to do his theology. So now we'll just look at one or two things that he says there. Brief Eric Fuster in Bran Jasper Rudolf Bultmann's work Wekong, nineteen eighty four, page seventy three, seventy four. Translation is my own, says uh, David Ferguson. In a in a letter.
I must frankly confess to you that the war was not shattering experience for me. Of course, there were endless issues, but not the war as such. It is clear to me, as I have maintained in numerous conversations, that what happens in a war is not different from peacetime, a shipwreck, an act of meanness as they occur daily. Present to us exactly the same question as the mass of events in the war. I do not believe, therefore, that the war influenced my theology. On the question of the origin of our theology, I am of the opinion that the internal debate with the theology of our teachers plays an incomparably greater role than the experience of the war or the reading of Dostoevsky. So I'll read that again. I must frankly confess to you that the war was not a shattering experience for me. Of course, there were endless issues, but not the war as such. It is clear to me, as I have maintained in numerous conversations, that what happens in war is not different from peacetime. A shipwreck, an act of meanness, as they occur daily, present to us exactly the same question as the mass events in the war. I do not believe, therefore, that the war influenced my theology. On the question of the origin of our theology, I am of the opinion that the internal debate with, it, with theology of our teachers plays an incomparably greater role than the experience of the war or the reading of Dostoevsky. So what Bultmann is saying there is in the context of the First World War, liberalism died a death, basically. Liberal theology had the idea that man would get better, that we would just do social action and social projects, and the world would get better. But when the First World War came, the liberal theology just was destroyed, just decimated. Bultmann says, I must frankly confess to you that the war was not a shattering experience for me. So for Bultmann, the First World War was not, did not destroy his liberal ideas, liberal in theology. And then he goes on to say that on this question of the origin of our theology, I am of the opinion that the internal debate with the theology of our teachers plays an incomparably greater role than the experience of the war. So what he's saying there is tradition, the liberal tradition, the Schleiermacher, the Hermann, the Rachel and all the rest of it, that liberal tradition is central. That is what he's concentrating on, that is what he's reflecting on, that is, he's continuing the legacy of the liberal tradition in theology. So now, um, I want to bring your attention to the Miracle of Faith chapter. Excuse me. Bullman believed that God was not knowable as in a mathematical formula. I think God is known in the act. There is no objective truth as in a world view. Um, we read in uh, David Ferguson's book, the results of object to objectify entails setting out a thesis which can be discussed and acknowledged in detachment from the reality in question. The results of objectification are the fruits of human labor. But when objectifying patterns of thought intrude into the theology of faith is distorted. So he's saying there that there is no access to objectivity in the knowledge of God. And if we try to do that, that will spoil our understanding of God. I completely dif disagree with that. I completely disagree. I believe there is objectivity. You can look at the life and death of Jesus and that can lead you to an objective knowledge of God. I believe there is experience that comes into it, subjective experience, and I would grant Boltman that. But it's more than just 
personal experience is based on objective truth. So basically what we get then in Boltman is he uses Christian language of faith and the teaching of the Bible's understanding of faith but he uses it as a cloak for his existential philosophy. So we read, faith is never self-evident, natural, it is always miraculous. So hearing that, you would think he believes in miracles. He doesn't believe in miracles. The belief that God is the Father and man is the child of God is not an insight we can be gained directly. It is an insight at all. It is not an insight at all. On the contrary, it must be believed even and again as the miraculous act of God. So again, knowledge, and knowledge of God and knowledge of religion is an act of faith, a crisis of faith in terms of the moment you exercise faith then you are resolving the crisis. But that, that's not Christianity. Christianity teaches you have faith in Christ objectively speaking and then you'll get saved. So Boltman uses the words like justification um, and all the rest of it and it almost sounds like evangelical theology but it's not, it, it's again this existential philosophy. He writes, we know about revelation because it belongs to our life. You cannot communicate a concept of revelation to someone in the way in which you can communicate to him that there are species of fish that bear with you young alive or that there are carnivorous plants. There is no revelation in this sense. Rather, if you speak to someone of revelation, you speak to him about his authentic life and the conviction that revelation belongs to his life, just as do light and darkness and love and friendship. So again, it's about experience. It's about lived experience in the now. That is what truth is. That is what knowledge of God is. It's lived experience in now. Well, Christianity is more than just a lived experience. Christianity is a knowledge of the objective living God through Jesus Christ, who is objectively real. It's not just an experience. It's an experience of objective truth. So we could go uh, into more extensive thinking about Boltman's teaching on uh, on faith, but I think basically to sum it up, faith is basically an action, a moment by moment action in every new situation is a new chance to act in faith and that is truth and that is knowledge of God again I would disagree I would say that faith is in an object it is faith is in the objective truth of Jesus Christ um, and that is our faith and we have a moment by moment trust in such a person who is truly alive and real so basically what we've done in this video is looked at the intellectual roots of liberalism and Rudolf Bultmann 
and it, it's very very key if you want to understand theology if you want to really master theology then having a good understanding of how the 19th century theology played out it is a good place to stand and that's what we've done in this video we've really just looked a little bit about the life of Bultmann and then really just unpacked uh, the intellectual foundation of Western theology in the 19th century uh, starting from a later date than the uh, Enlightenment <coughs> and then I've gone over the ground and just picked apart a little bit these various theological movements to show you how easily it can be done but at the time these movements were massive and everybody followed them or seemed to think that they were important so that's where we're finished now we'll pick up tomorrow hopefully on um, we'll talk a little bit more about Boltman's idea of faith and then we'll move on to his ideas of hermeneutics and we'll move on uh, to his idea of the theology of the New Testament and his demythologizing program and then look at uh, post Boltman uh, scholarship um, so that's where we're going I uh, hope you've been blessed by this video and uh, so I'll see you tomorrow night if you want to come back for part two on Rudolf Bultmann so take care and God bless you I'm going to close in prayer Lord I thank you for this day and I thank you for your love and your grace I give you the prayers of the glory and the honor and father I just pray that you bless this video uh, to your people may they become wiser and stronger in faith in your name and for your glory amen amen god bless you and see you tomorrow or in the next day or two take care Hi folks, this is Jay. Hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. We're doing uh, Rudolf Bultmann uh, Part 2, and this is a resource for theology students, uh, seminarians, uh, priests, pastors, bishops, uh, theologians. Uh, it's just a little resource for you to either give your students or to uh, think about yourself. Uh, the source for uh, this chat and discussion is Rudolf Bultmann, um, Outstanding Christian Thinkers, David Ferguson, uh, pay, uh, uh, London and New York Continuum, and uh, it's 1992, um, reissued in 2000. So we'll be f reading a few quotes uh, from this book. Uh, the good thing about this book is it's got a good bibliography, uh, so that if you want to be a Bultmann scholar or do research it, in a PhD or a master's or if you were doing an essay on Bultmann uh, there's a massive uh, bibliography and points you to uh, there's a number of bibliographies uh, within this book for each chapter and it points you to other resources for Bultmann scholarship uh, so without further ado let's uh, come before the Lord and ask his blessing <clears throat> Father God we thank you for this day and we give you the praise and the glory and the honor we thank you for your love and your grace and uh, we thank you for your goodness and your blessings and so Lord we come before you now and we ask for your blessings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and for your glory Lord may you be honored and may you be glorified in Jesus name Amen Amen okay um, just to recap what we did um, in the first video uh, we looked at a little bit about the life of uh, Rudolf Bultmann we looked at the legacy of liberalism and we looked at various influences such as Schleimacher and Rachel and Herman and some of these liberal theologians that went into the influence of Rudolf Bultmann and I, I did a backflip. I these scholars that I mentioned, I would do a critique of them. I did a critique of the Enlightenment, if you remember, but also made the point as um, Ferguson makes the point that the Enlightenment was at the heart of the liberal um, theological project. I made the point also that I'm a conservative evangelical and I do not agree with 
and the theology of Boltman, and I made that clear too. Now we're going to look at some really uh, important issues, and on page 50 we're going to look at the I'm going to look at the hermeneutical task and then uh, the theology of the New Testament and then the demythologizing program and then basically just finish with a few uh, post-Bultman scholarship. Uh, so that's where we're at, okay? The hermeneutical task, uh, page 50 of uh, Ferguson's book. He says this, hermeneutics is the science of the interpretation of written text. Traditionally, it referred to the rules governing grammatical forms and individual terms. By mastering these rules, it becomes possible to translate and to interpret an ancient text. In this sense, hermeneutics is restricted to the principles of informing philology. Then uh, Ferguson goes on to point out that uh, the Schleimacher added a new element to hermeneutics. It was not only about grammar. It was also seen that we had to get into the psychological makeup of a writer if we wanted to know what the writer actually said. So, uh, quote uh, Ferguson, uh, page 51, our understanding of soliloquy or a headline is conditioned by our understanding of what the meaning of the whole text is. At the same time, our understanding of the whole can only be arrived at through the interpretation of the parts. There is thus an inevitable circularity in any process of interpretation. End of quote. Page 51, again at the end of the book, uh, end of the chapter, uh, end of the page, we read the presuppositions that govern the interpretation can themselves be modified and transformed in the interpretive act. For this reason, the image of the hermeneutical spiral has sometimes been preferred to that of the circle. Nonetheless, the point remains that without some prior understanding on the part of the inquirer, the meaning of the text cannot be comprehended. And then there was uh, Wilhelm Dilthe, uh, 1833 to 1911, that continued the, the philosophical uh, reflection concerning hermeneutics and influenced um, Boltman. We read these words, uh, I'll just get you the uh, reference for this. Uh, this is from the works of uh, selected passages of Dilthey's works H. A. Hodges, Wilhelm Dilthey, Routledge in Keegan, Paul, London, 1969, page 142. So this philosopher says this, it is through the process of understanding that life in its depths is made clear to itself. And on the other hand, we understand ourselves and others only when we transfer our own lived experience into every kind of expression of our own and other people's life. Thus everywhere, the relation between lived experience, expression and understanding is the proper procedure by which mankind as an object in the human studies exist for us. Uh, so that's uh, Dilthey, uh, the philosopher's uh, view on hermeneutics. Um, Going further on on page 52, we read uh, from Ferguson, who says, It is only from within a certain within a s certain historical situation that a text can be interpreted and understood. The text itself belongs to another person's history, and understanding that text may enable interpreters to reach a deeper understanding of their own historical existence. Now, Bultmann uh, took Schleimacher, he took Dilthey, and he took also uh, Heidegger and was influenced by he Heidegger. And in Ferguson's book on page 53, we read, The questions that are put to the text will have a bearing upon answers that are discovered there. We read page 53, like Dilthey and Heidegger, Bultmann constantly emphasized the importance of the historical nature of human existence. It is only the by participation and self-involvement in concrete existence that understanding can take place. Existential interpretation can occur by way of neutral detachment. Sorry. Existential interpretation cannot 
occur by way of neutral detachment or cold analysis. It is only when interpreters are engaged personally with the basic questions of their existence that existential understanding can occur. We read, um, just get the source for this. Uh, this is problems of new hermeneutics. I think it's um, Bultmann. The more subjective interpretation is the most objective because the only person who is able to hear the claim of the text is the person who is moved by the question of his or own existence. Now we can't go into uh, a deeper analysis of of Bultmann's um, projects, hermeneutical task. But then again we can. Um, I think it's important to do that because hermeneutics is a, is a very important subject in any academic discipline. So I'm going to read a few more quotes. In Karl Barth's Epistle to Romans, we read, Calvin, having first established what stands in the text, sets himself to rethink the whole material and to wrestle with it till the walls which separate the 16th century and the first become transparent. Paul speaks and the man of the 16th century hears. The conversation between the original record and the reader moves round the subject matter until a distinction between yesterday and today becomes possible. Ferguson says, in reviewing this, Bultmann, although endorsing Barth's theological exegesis, insists that he has overlooked the, the extent to which Paul is a man of his time and therefore bears the influence of a wide range of beliefs and practices which belong to the first century but not to the 20th. In order to determine the valid existential meaning of Paul's word, it is necessary to discriminate the spirit of Christ from the other spirits that are living in the writing. And then page 58, it is necessary for the theologian to heed the work of the historical critic before presenting a theological interpretation of scripture. The presupposition of historical inquiry is that the events of history form a causal continuum and can therefore be explained in terms of the context and circumstances under which they occurred. This imposes the following constraints upon the interpretation of the New Testament. Number one, the rules of grammar and translation that govern the language. Number two, the particular usage and style of the individual authors must be recognized. Three, the thought world inhabited by the writers must be investigated. And four, the social circumstances that gave rise to the writing of the text must be explored. So we'll, we'll get on to the influence of Heidegger um, on uh, Bultmann's hermeneutical task. But I just want to throw in a, a few provisos and important thoughts here uh, concerning this exegetical method. I agree. I, I think there are some good points with Bultmann's idea. It, it is important uh, to get the historical context of a text. Um, that goes without question. To, to look at the grammar, to look at why the writer has written the piece of material, uh, to look at it in its overall cultural context when you look in a passage of the Bible. So I agree with the historical grammatical uh, underpinnings of what Bultmann is saying. But the historical grammatical underpinnings are underpinned by some other presuppositions that undermine, that actually undermine um, the exegetical task. Because even though Bultmann says that he pays uh, attention to the historical context, the cultural context, and the grammatical context, the fact of the matter is his existential philosophy that he has gained from Heidegger and other philosophers becomes the hermeneutical tool within his exegesis. So we'll find later on, which I'll bring out in more detail later on, we find that Heid, uh, we find that Bultmann, when he's expounding Paul's theology, is basically a straitjacket, a hermeneutical straitjacket from Heidegger. So we get certain terms by Paul that Paul uses, 
uh, theological terms and those terms are controlled by the philosophical terms of Heidegger that Boltman smuggles in in his uh, hermeneutical task. The second thing is that there is a presupposition against propositional revelation. The idea that God can speak through words is not a given within this exegetical task. So it's not about finding the mind of the author as in i.e. God as well as the natural author of the text. But it's more about the existential moment, finding the answer to an existential question at this present time, whatever that might be. And that is the concrete knowledge that we can gain. But that is not what real exegesis is all about. It's, a, it's about coming into contact with an objective text that can give us objective knowledge of God. Now that does not discount the subjectivity or the uh, presuppositional uh, the presuppositional baggage that we bring to a text, or the fact that we we are in uh, a position of learning where we are constantly learning from a text. Th it, that is not discounted, but it's important to recognize recognize that in the Protestant evangelical tradition, we are ex we are studying an objective text, a text that speaks to us of God and a text by God objectively who's worked in history and has inspired propositional revelation uh, that has been recorded and so therefore it is uh, behoven on us to look at that text and to study it as best we can and to gain a knowledge of what it's saying and so it's not just about asking questions today and how are they answered within the text but it's about finding the mind of the author and how then does that text relate to today. So that's a significant difference in uh, her the hermeneutical text than what Heidegger would suggest. And also I think, and, and what that means is that we can know truth, we can know God. We're not going to know him in in his fullness because he's infinite but we can not we can have knowledge of God we can have knowledge of the truth it doesn't mean to say that the truth is exhaustive because we're only finite we're only limited and we continue to learn but that mm -hmm. truth is there irrespective of whether I bring a background to the text or not that is a significantly different different understanding of hermeneutics than Boltman and I think much of modern scholarship today. I must reiterate, and I must reiterate this as a very important point in the hermeneutical task, because I can hear the clamors of the feminist theologians and all the other theologians that are around today that you're just simply discounting, you're just ignoring the fact of what Bultman is saying that we are engaged in an experience and as our experience connects with the experience of the past we can have a new experience today but you're forgetting that it is an experience today of ourselves that brings to the exegetical task a continual circularity of information as they both interact with each other, your experience with the experience of the text. One doesn't disagree with this. One does not deny this. There is a constant communication between ourselves and the text. There is no doubt about that. But the text is objective. And that's the point. The text is God 
move who has come and spoken into the historical time frame of our existence objectively speaking and there is the problem with modern hermeneutical methods it is really in a cycle of subjectivity whereas process and dogmatics is in a cycle of objectivity with subjective reflection in other words we come with our own experiences but we come to the objective word of God that has spoken to us in time and in history what are the implications of that well what that means is you end up then if you take that kind of hermeneutical method that I'm expounding that was expounded by Adel Schlatter and so those who are theologians today would do well to go and study the paper and the writings on hermeneutics by Adel Schlatter what that means is you're going to pay much more important um, work to the exegetical task than you've ever done <coughs> and you're going to make sure that you allow the author to speak and make sure that your presuppositions are pushed to the side as best you can to allow the text to speak for itself that is what John Calvin did and there was a mighty revolution it's what the Renaissance actually did. The Renaissance actually promoted the kind of hermeneutics that I'm trying to t tell you about. Once we get into the kind of Heidegger, uh, into the Rudolf Bultmann kind of hermeneutical task, he says it is objective and subjective, but ultimately it's just subjective. But all you end up doing is exegeting a God of your own image God becomes your little eisegesis rather than exegesis that is to say that you take a text and you're just making God in your own image it's all about you and about what you think it's not about the objective God who has spoken to you objectively in his word those are my initial thoughts uh, on Boltman's hermeneutics there. Hermeneutics is a very, very difficult task, very, very difficult uh, to deal with uh, philosophically. Uh, but I'm trying to give you pointers to move in a different direction than our modern academic world is going in concerning hermeneutics and has been going in for about 30 or 40 years. I'm trying to encourage you to move the other direction and move over to Adel Schlatter. Uh, rather than the Boltman program. So now we're going to look at uh, Boltman and his influence by Heidegger. Uh, Martin Heidegger, 1889 to 1976. Uh, Ferguson said is one of the most important and difficult 20th century philosophers. For the purpose of understanding his influence about Boltman, it will be sufficient to confine our attention to his time and being. And so I'll stop there. Time and being. It's basically saying, uh, so I think, um, that we become authentic human beings as we act. That That's as best as I can um, answer, that it is not about the Cartesian uh, project. If you remember Descartes, I think therefore I am. Uh, what that project was is that ontologically, onto, ontology means being, the project is that ontologically there is an, a, a, an objective being of a human and an objective being of a God and it, and it is this ontological knowledge that allows us then to gain general knowledge of our surroundings. So, so I'll say that again, the Cartesian project, the project of Descartes is basically uh, the human condition has ontological status, that is the human being has an, a being, an objective being, and God has an objective being. And Heidegger turned this on its head and said, no, it's not ontological being, it's, it's not a, a, a static 
a static aspect of what it is to be human or, or to, to be God. It is more in action and the action of a moment. That is what it is to be a, a human being. And so we read, we read these words. Um, I'll just read a few of these words here. <clears throat> so this is from Being in Time, page 100. This is Heidegger, Being in Time, page 100. If its kind of being as ready to hand is disregarded, this nature itself can be discovered and defined simply in its pure present at hand. When this happens, the nature which stirs and strives, which assails us and enthralls us as a landscape, remains hidden. The botanist plants are not the flowers of the hedgerow, the source which the geographer establishes for a river is not the springhead in the dale. Page 61, Ferguson says, The being of Dasein is manifest in the phenomenon of care or sorge. Care or concern is one of the fundamental features of Dasein and distinguishes human existence from the reality belonging to the entities. Dasein is an entity for which in its being that being is an issue in the phenom phenomenon of care other structures of human existence are brought to light Dasein is fundamentally being in the world it is being which is situated in a world of things and other persons Dasein belongs inextricably to a material and social world the world is a place in which I find myself bound up in a network of relations with things and people material objects are known primarily as items of equipment which determine my practical concern and other persons are with those whom I share in the world. It's, it kind of sounds like an existential pragmatist really. So there is a hiddenness in this knowledge of the hermeneutical task from Heidegger's perspective as well is that we we don't fully get to know the subject or the, uh, the object. There is an unveiling. Um, Ferguson writes, human existence is not fixed and determined, it contains potential and possibility. Here the relationship of being to time is crucial. For Heidegger, truth is not primarily a property belonging to propositions that accurately mirror external realities. Truth in its more ancient sense is the uncovering of what previously lies concealed. Uh, Magda King writes, whereas traditional philosophy has for long regarded the proposition as the primary locus of truth, Heidegger shows it is too to be a far-off derivative of original truth whose locus is the existential continuation of man's being and care. And then in page 63 of Ferguson, understanding for Heidegger is a basic mode of existence rather than intellectual grasp of ideas. which to me is a contradiction by the way. And so, uh, so Rudolf Bultmann takes Schleimacher, he takes uh, other philosophers, but he takes Heidegger and he applies Heidegger to the hermeneutical task. Heidegger, it must always remember, was always primarily influenced by Wilhelm Hermann. So always remember that. That he was influenced by Wilhelm Hermann principally, who was a, a die in the wool liberal. But un encrusted into this hermeneutical task, which was influenced by liberalism, was this sprinkling of Heidegger. So Heidegger's philosophy, says Ferguson, page 65, was in many ways another catalyst that Bultmann was waiting for and their collaboration in Magba during the 1920s 20s left a permanent mark on all Bultmann's theological writing. Bultmann says, I found in it conceptuality in which it is possible to speak adequately of human existence and therefore also of the existence of the believer.
So Heidegger, uh, Bultmann applying Heidegger fell into a discourse and debate with Karl Barth. Karl Barth said we shouldn't use philosophy and theology and Bultmann said well we should. We can't escape it. And I just want to read one last quote. Page um, H.G. Gadamer, Truth and Method, page 296. And, and this is the conclusion from Gadamer's Truth and Method. The presupposition that one is moved by the question of God already involves a claim to knowledge concerning the true God and his revelation. Even unbelief is defined in terms of the faith that is demanded of one. The existential for understanding which is Bultmann's starting point can only be a Christian one. So Gadamer in Truth and Method basically is criticizing Bultmann by saying look all this subjectivity that you're saying, all this subjectivity about God that is in the moment presupposes the Christian God anyway. <coughs> now I'm not going to go into it here but just to say that there were certain philosophical categories that Heidegger had two, two or three very important principles and Bultmann took those principles and imposed them imposed the Heideggerian hermeneutical method imposed them on his exegesis of the New Testament and so he didn't allow actually the New Testament to fully speak for itself but his Heideggerian philosophy um, trammeled that interpretation and, and that has become one of the main critiques of Bultmann today in the academic world Uh, so that's the hermeneutical task and uh, if you want to look at hermeneutics and study it in I would encourage you to go to Dr. Bob Hutley's website if you type in Dr. Bob Hutley uh, free commentaries uh, and you go on his site you will find um, a couple of books that you could download for free on hermeneutics and those books are absolutely brilliant and you can listen to his lectures and you'll find them stimulating and you'll find them helpful to develop uh, your hermeneutical skills in the studying of the scriptures. Uh, for those who are more philosophically minded uh, I would encourage you to if you want to de think uh, from a more philosophical academic point of view I'd encourage you to read uh, from a church perspective I'd encourage you to read uh, the history of hermeneutics, especially the area of Alex the Alexandrian and the Antioch school. So try and find some literature on the Antioch and the uh, Alexandrian school of the early church. Also uh, on hermeneutics in modern uh, academic scene, uh, Racour, uh, French philosopher and uh, specialist in hermeneutics, uh, has written wrote quite a bit on this subject. Uh, Rakur is perhaps one of the leading, has been one of the leading thinkers on hermeneutics. Uh, I would not agree with him, but if you want to think about it at the high echelons of academia, uh, Rakur is a place, a French philosopher that you would do well to read. Uh, on reading text, the deconstructionist um, Um, just trying to think. Uh, just slipped my head. Uh, deconstructionist. I should, Derrida. Yeah, sorry, my just, my just a bit tired. Derrida um, is a guy who's written quite, a, wrote a quite a lot on hermeneutics and uh, reading text. Then you got Raku. For myself, I would encourage that those are those are kind of stuff that you can look at academically. There's also a course at Yale University that you can go to uh, on literary theory and looks at uh, a whole bag and range of hermeneutical methods of understanding the text. 
and that's at Yale University. Uh, if you go on YouTube, Yale University, look at uh, just type in uh, liter uh, 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 literature course, and you'll find a course on how to interpret text. And there, it looks at uh, Neopragmatism, it looks at deconstructionism, and it looks at, at a whole lot of uh, various hermeneutical methods. Um, but I would also say that for me, um, having looked at these modern understandings of hermeneutics, I would encourage you to go back to Adolf Schlatter. You can read his paper on hermeneutics. Uh, if you type in Adolf Schlatter on hermeneutics, you'll be able to get his paper and uh, also have a read of his works and look at how he does hermeneutics and that is the way modern scholarship in philosophy in theology needs to go it needs to go back to the Adel Schlatter way of doing uh, hermeneutics basically and you as a theologian if you're a theologian if you're a bishop or if you're a pastor you need to go back to that method and uh, Ad uh, Dr. Bob Utley uh, has written a, a wonderful book on hermeneutics that will uh, supply you with the actual tools of expounding the Bible. So those are the two recommendations, Dr. Bob Utley and Adolf Schlatter, that I give you. But I put you on to some more philosophical material if you want to read widely. Okay, uh, Derrida, Raku, uh, etc. There's a nice little uh, lecture on neo-pragmatism uh, on the Yale University YouTube site, and the the two neo-pragmatists are mentioned there. You can download the paper uh, on hermeneutics from a neo-pragmatist point of view. Uh, so, yeah, just a, a little aside. If you want to look at how to do expository uh, hermeneutics and you want good models, I would suggest from a preaching point of view, John MacArthur, John Piper, R.C. Spruill, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, these are excellent people that you can type in, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones Recording Trust, uh, go to there, you can go on the website and you'll find excellent uh, preaching and his preaching will show you how to expand a text. And John MacArthur is an excellent Bible teacher. Look at him, and you'll see how to expound a text from John MacArthur's perspective. So that's uh, on hermeneutics. Okay. Now we come to. Um, Well, we've covered quite a lot of ground, even in the hermeneutics. So I think what we'll do now is we'll we'll just quickly go through uh, some of. I think we spent quite a bit of time on his hermeneutics there, and I think I think that is actually the key, really, to be honest, with Boltman. But there's so much that we could go through. Uh, Anyhow, let's let's look at what he says concerning Jesus. Uh, page 73 of Ferguson book, Bultman says this, I do indeed think that we can know almost nothing concerning the life and personality of Jesus, since the early Christian sources show no interest in either are, are more fragmentary and often legendary, and other sources about Jesus do not exist. So that's Bultman on the life of Jesus. Now, we have to remember that when Boltman says we can't know anything about Jesus ultimately, generally speaking, he does not say that we can't know anything about Jesus. This is a very important point with Boltman. I, I disagree with the guy, but this is a, a very important point with Boltman. Boltman, even though he's saying we, we can't know much about Jesus, he's not saying we can't know anything about Jesus. And so Boltman to his credit, or even though I disagree with him in his in his philosophy and theology and whatever, to his credit, uh, he would spend a lot of time in his form criticism trying to find uh, historical information about Jesus. And if you look at his... Mm -hmm. 
Hiya, Mark. Are you all right? Hey, brother. How are you Hello, doing? Are you all right? You're all right. You're all right. I'm, I'm just doing Rudolf Bultman. <laughs> all right. I'm on a Google Hangout. I'm doing Rudolf Bultman part two. I've just done his hermeneutics. Should we, should we listen in then? Are you sure? Yeah, go on. We're listening. I'm well, just saying right. that this is what he says about Jesus. Right. I do indeed think that we can know almost nothing concerning the life of personality of Jesus, since the early Christian sources show no interest in either or moreover fragmentary and often legendary, legendary and other sources about Jesus do not exist. And what I was saying is, uh, uh, on two fronts, just to start with, that uh, he basically, um, even though he's saying we can't know much, he did believe we can know something, and he did write a magnum opus book on the Gospel of John, where he did intricate, detailed analysis of various texts to try and find something about Jesus. But mm -hmm. uh, modern scholarship has completely turned around Bultman now, so uh, modern scholarship would say that we can know a lot about Jesus. Uh, because the sources are more earlier than Boltman would have us to believe. So I'll only do this for five more minutes and then I'll pull it off and we can chat, guys. No, you're right, like Jay. Take as long as you can, mate. Um, all I was saying that Boltman, uh, in his hermeneutical method, he, he used a German philosopher called uh, Heidegger and Heidegger's philosophy and so when Bultmann was expounding the Bible and trying to look at what the Bible was saying or the New Testament he was actually he wasn't actually listening to the Bible he was influenced by Heidegger's philosophy so when he's expounding Paul mm. he's actually expounding Heidegger's philosophy not Paul and uh, so um, Boltman's understanding of the New Testament is basically, uh, I'll just finish with this and then I'll close and just say where, where things are at. Um, basically, Boltman's project is saying that the first century Jews and the first century Jesus and all the rest of it is not the same as our culture. We're scientific, we're modern, and so that means miracles can't happen. And so we're not to take it seriously when we read the New Testament. You know, it's, an, it's, a, it's a bygone age. And so what we've got to do is we've got to just strip it of all its legend and all its myth and all the rest of it and get to the basic core of who Jesus may be. And then when we read the text, we have questions for today about our own existence. And as we read the text of these little bits of historical Jesus that we can find through all the legend, then that is really the the core of what it's all about. And the whole problem with that is um, it just discounts the supernatural. It's prejudice against the supernatural. And science isn't prejudiced against the supernatural. In quantum physics, I don't know much about quantum physics, but in quantum physics, in, in, in the time of Kant and Hume, they believe they believe generally, n not you, but just before you. They believe that an event had a cause and effect, and it was applied to miracles. They said, like nature affects nature, so nothing supernatural breaks through it. But in the twenty in nineteen twenties, they discovered quantum mechanics. And what they realized is nature's in deep down is much more complex, and they don't fully understand what goes on. So the quantum issue means that you've always got to be open. Something could happen in nature that you've not accounted for. And that's why science developed probability, that we can only be probable about certain things. What all this means is that quantum mechanics uh, and stuff like that basically means that science is open to the miraculous. It's not against the miraculous. Something could always break in into the historical flaw that science has not accounted for because it doesn't fully understand what goes on at the quantum level. And that means when you look at history, you should be open to whether miracles have taken place or not. You should look at all the, the only way to discount a miracle is to look at the evidence, 
not to push it out beforehand and say science discards it. And so you get an example where David Hume, um, he said that he, he had five, five criteria for examining miracles. And he began to examine the French Catholics. And this is a skeptic, and he, it was um, Pascal and his friends. They had all the, all the people were getting healing in the aristocracy in France in the 1600s. Ooh. And David Hume, he was in the 1700s. He went back and read the papers and the testimonies. And he said, according to my criteria, my five criteria, these miracles took place. But then he said, but just, but they didn't take place because miracles don't happen. But the point being that if you actually look at the evidence like Hume did, and you look at the historical evidence, you can get evidence that the miracles took place. But the reason why people reject miracles is not because of the evidence, it's because they push it out prior before, saying science discounts it, but science doesn't. And so that was the problem with, with Rudolf Bultmann. He's saying the Bible's full of legend, not because he's proved it in evidence. He's, dis he's, he's just discounted the supernatural by a prior belief in science, which is misplaced. And with that, we'll end Boltman. <laughs> so there we are. So basically, just stick to your Bible, guys. And it, <laughs> uh, <laughs> nice. Stick to the Bible. Stick to the Word of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey, I was in Manchester today preaching. Woo! -hoo! How are you doing? <laughs> yeah. How are you doing? What's been happening? If we're good. We're good. We can't okay. see you though. We just got this guy with a wig on again. I know. I'll turn it off in a minute, and I'll I'll uh, <laughs> I'll say goodbye to the viewers in a sec. But oh, I tell you what, <laughs> I was in Manchester today preaching. Right, I was preaching on hell. Oh. <laughs> But I was saying, I was going on, I was saying, I was saying, uh, when you see preachers with boards with hell on, you think, oh, it's control, they're trying to put fear into you. And I said, uh, you know, when you hear about hell, you think, oh, it's about fear. I said, but hell, all hell is about, if you don't believe in hell, you don't believe in the holiness of God. You don't believe in sin. And people were listening. They were really yeah. listening. And I, I preached for about an hour, and then I was giving out tracks, and near the end of the day, about 4 o'clock, someone gave me a bottle of water, I drank it, and I went to go and put it in the bin. And it was a five-minute walk from where I, were, where I was. And this um, elderly lady came up to me, and she said, I can't speak, I can't speak. If I speak, I'll start crying. She said, but I heard you earlier today preaching. He said, she said, uh, keep preaching, but if I talk about it, I'll, I'll start crying. You know? That's awesome, Jim. Yeah, I know. I thought, whoa. So as soon as she walked off, yeah. as soon as she... Oh, that, that again? Tell Claire, say it again, Jim. I was saying, Claire. <laughs> there was this woman with three big ears. <laughs> I'm doing emails, I'm working, yeah. Six eyes <laughs> and fangs as big as a, a Dracula, though. No, you weren't. <laughs> no, I was preaching on hell, right? And then later on in the day, near the end of the day, I had this bottle of water, I drank it and went to put it in the bin, and it was quite a walk away from where I was. So I got there, so I'm away from where I was preaching, quite a way. <laughs> and um, this old woman come up to me, and... She just said to me, um, just trying to remember, she just said, um, I was walking past and I just, I heard what you said and I can't speak now because if I speak about it, i.e. what she heard me preaching, if I speak about it, I'll just start crying. Mm. And she said, just keep on doing what you're doing. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. And then she said it again, I, I can't speak about it, I can't speak about it, I'll start yeah. crying. Uh, How old was she, Jay? About oh, 60 or 65. 70. That's awesome, that Jay. She looked like yeah. Ilda Rogdon, you know, she was all right. Yeah. yeah. So, I, and, and so as soon as she's done that, I thought, wow, I was really encouraged. So I was knackered and I was ready to go on, but I went back to where I was, started giving it. As I was giving out tracks, I was just preaching out. <laughs> yeah. 
I didn't preach on hell that time. I just preached on hell. I was just going. Yeah. Just yeah. I was just going, Hallelujah, yeah. here's the track. You know, yeah. I've done more street preaching than you, I don't have your day. Yeah. I used to do it when I first became a Christian, you haven't. No. <laughs> I, I had a young lad as well. I had some 15 year old kids, you know, come. And um, they come up to me like, they look like grammar school kids, and this, this young lad, like, he says, I'm gay. Will gays go to heaven, you know? Yeah. And I said, mate. I said, you know, Jesus loves you, and, and I said, he died for you, you know. He really, really died for you, and he loves you. He said, yes, I know, but well, well, if, if I, if, will, I, will, I, will gays go to, go to heaven? And I said, well, if they believe in Jesus. He says, oh, oh, I can be gay and go to heaven then. I said, no, let me explain, look. I said, when you believe in Jesus, he becomes your king. And I pointed to his head, I said, see, you, see your nose, you're the king of your nose, you're the king of your lips. And he went, what do you mean? I said, well, you can do whatever you want with your nose, go wherever you want, smell whatever you want. With your mouth, you can smell whatever you want. I said, and with your sex organs, you can do what you want, yeah? You're the king of that. I said, but when you believe in Jesus, he's the king of your nose, he's the king of your money, he's the king of your sex organs. So when you believe in Jesus, you, you come into line with him, and he's the king. And I said, you know, I said, I struggle with sex. I said, I have, like, my my struggles, but Jesus is my king, and I want to follow him. I said, you've got your struggles. I said, I'm not saying it's going to be easy if you become a Christian, but Christ wants you to move his way, not your way. I said, and it's, I said I've never met a, 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 whole, a gay person. I said, I've never met a gay person yet who's been able to give me an intellectual defense of being gay. I said, it's not intellectual defense. You, you're gay because you feel it, and I understand that. You feel it passionately, you know, and, and I get that. I said, but if it's going to be the truth, it's got to be of the mind and of the heart, and yours is of the heart. I said, and I can prove to you that Jesus lived, he died, and he rose again. That's the head. I said, and then the heart is he'll come in and, he'll, and, he, and he meets with you and he changes you. I said, you've just got the heart. You feel this way. I said, but it's about coming in line with Christ and trusting in him because he's the truth. And he'll mm. change you. It won't be easy. And he said, so as, so he said, um, well, he said, so, um, so is that what the Bible teaches? I said, well, you can either be, I said, you can either be a trendy vicar who says that bit in the Bible is okay, but that bit in the Bible is not. I said, but at the end of the day, either the Bible's the word of God or it's not. And he said, yeah. And he, and he said, if it's the Bible, you've got to follow it, haven't you? I said, yeah. And he said, the Bible doesn't teach it, does it? I said, yeah, that's right. And he said, oh, I get it now, right, thank you. And he said, I'm going to think about it. You know. Yeah. So he knew that he was loved by God, but he knew, yeah. what, he knew God's standard. And I tried to communicate him that I struggle, so I'm not trying to judge him. Yeah. That if he becomes a believer, if he's if he is gay and he becomes a believer, that he will he might struggle. He probably struggle. Yeah, I find it difficult. But I said, yeah. So I communicated that to him. So, but that he was, sounds great, that you? But he was a delight. He was a lovely guy. You know, he's a lovely little guy. Yeah. So if you could pray for him, he was really nice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's great, actually. So that's it. So I've had a great day. Yeah. Good. Good stuff. And uh, well, yeah, that's nothing else to report really. Just uh, preach, just preach for about two hours, and just gave uh, leaflets out and stuff, and had lots yeah. of good conversations and stuff. And uh, Moab and Roxana came, just popped in to say, "Oh, they just live down the road there, Iranians." Oh yeah. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so great stuff, Jay. Awesome, brother. They've got a good-looking cousin there as well. She was, <laughs> like, <laughs> she was good looking. I was looking at her ads if she had a ring on her fingers or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I said you'll have to come for tea. <laughs> she bought a suitcase. This cousin, it was the biggest suitcase you'd ever see. It looked, I'm not kidding. It looked like it. It was massive. 
It looked like two. I don't know. They just bought it. No, she just bought it. Oh, right. I said, right. what have you bought that for? You're going around the world twice or something, I said. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, it's been a good day. It was nice. I, I really enjoy going out preaching and sharing the gospel. I enjoyed it in Liverpool. I was preaching in Liverpool the other day. And uh, outside McDonald's, <coughs> and this woman stopped and was listening. She came up to me. She says, "Oh, you don't need a mic, do you?" I know. <laughs> and that, then she walked off, and she talked to David. She started talking to David, and then I went up to David, and he, and he said, "Oh, she's a, a Roman Catholic, and she but she doesn't understand the gospel, and she's really interested, you know." So you get these you get these little encouragements. You think you're banging against your head against the wall, you know, but God encourages you. Yeah, that's awesome, that Jay. Yeah, it's great stuff. Yeah. So, have you finished recording now? I'm gonna finish now. So, yes. folks, thank you for listening. This is Jay Ball <laughs> signing out to all fans out there. Behave yourself, because I'll be watching <laughs> you. I'll be watching you. God bless everybody. Just having a bit of fun. Take care. And uh, any atheist out there who keeps saying hermeneutics. It's not hermeneutics, it's hermeneutics, okay? <laughs> <laughs> hermeneutics! Come on now! Take care, God bless. <laughs>